Hello, welcome to Trash Arts Tick, episode 21, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. Hey. So today, we're going to be discussing a little bit of industry stuff, Sam's going to take us through that, and um, we're also, well, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing um, a Canadian, French-Canadian director called Maud McCall, so we've got that to give you guys, and we've also, we're also going to be discussing demons today on our monthly horror discussion. So, without further ado, Sam, take us through industry. So, um, there was some casting news. There's been quite a lot of casting news, and I think it's because we're building towards Cannes film market. So I expect to say more, like, proper, like, film industry stuff next week. But the one that caught, kind of caught my eye is that Viggo Mortensen, who will never pronounce his name correctly. Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. A fantastic actor who's done some brilliant work with David Cronenberg, and recently was Oscar-nominated for Green Book, is reteaming with the director, Peter Fairley. And they're making a film called Beer Run, and it's a Vietnam film. Problem with this is like, I really love this actor, he's brilliant. And recently he seems to have softened the kind of roles he's going for. And obviously Green Book had a lot of controversy for being another white saviour film. He was brilliant in it. So was Marcella Ali. They were both amazing in the film. But, you know, it's like, I'd wish he'd make some more creatively, I basically I want David Cronenberg to come out of retirement and get Viggo Mortensen back working with him. <laughs> but that's, that's big that's, dreams. That's big dreams. <laughs> <clears throat> Recently, with everything happening with the Black Lives Matter um, movement, things are starting to change, and rightly so. So you're starting to see, a lot of it's been happening in TV, but one noticeable thing that people may have seen is that HBO Max have decided to remove Gone with the Wind. It will return at a later date with more of a historical context. And like, this is going to happen more and more people are going to get annoyed about it when really, for, for me, the, the key kind of concept here is we do it with different types of art. We do it with books. We do it with theatre. We give historical context to it. Film's been around for a long time now. There are going to be films that do not play as society should be playing right now. We're not right at that time. And we have to consider that more rather than just keeping him as a classic of cinema. Yeah, it needs to be just put in that sort of, that framework of something. Do you know what they've got, have they, have they got anything actually planned for how they're going to do this? Will it be like a... HBO released a statement about it, but they haven't done it yet. Okay. So it'll probably go off for like, whilst things are heated right now. And they'll probably be reconsidered, and, you know. But do you know what that will look like? Will it be like someone explaining at the beginning of the no, film? No, I don't. This contains no. Like, uh, I, I just, it's kind I of just like, feel like you know they might have said more about what how well, what. But they don't know. Do they don't this. know how to deal with it. I suppose, yeah, I suppose. So. But, well, we discussed this earlier. Like one of the things that I absolutely have no problem with this because when you have a film that's like for a mature audience, what does it say next to it? May contain violence, mm. sexual profanity, whatever. It's going to say a bunch of stuff. So why not have something with a bit more context beforehand? Yeah. yeah. There's been a massive story happening in the horror community in America, particularly in the Texas community. Um, there have been a lot of sexual harassment claims put upon a studio, Science State. And Science State are a, well, they're pretty much a right-wing studio. Their kind of motto is we're going to make films for genre audiences, but make sure the Trump audience like it at the same time. They've produced a lot of films that... They are enjoyable, but you have to take those political ideas on with them, such as Dragged uh, Across the Concrete, Brawl 99. And recently they produced the horror film Satanic Panic and VFW, which again are both great films. And, you know, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's already uncomfortable to know that the money is going in a Trump direction. But then when you find out that they've been, they hired a guy called Adam Donaghy, who essentially raped a young girl on the film shoot of A Ghost Story. And they kept him working, and he basically was a line producer. And yeah, you, you kind of, when that story came out in the Daily Beast, everyone within the horror community kind of desperately was furious and angry and just completely d disconnect with Science State. But Science State, unfortunately, are owned by one of the more adored horror magazines, Fangoria. Now, Fangoria, <clears throat> after losing so many creatives wanting to work with them, have recently just gone, we're going to cut ties with Science State. And now Fangoria is up for sale. So they actually did the right thing. And they didn't just go where the corporate money was going. And they went, actually, no, let's have some standards here. At the same time, the CEO of Fangoria 
quit because he got some sexual harassment stuff. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. But it's, yeah, it's been quite a huge thing and it's really like depressing because recently horror has been showing such a progressive sort of like attitude by progressing with getting more women involved with horror, more people from diverse different backgrounds. And then this happens and you're kind of like, Ugh, back to, you know, back to that. But yeah, everything's still got skeletons in the closet. I think yeah. there's, there's a lot more to come out about every... Unfortunately, oh, yeah. Much. Yeah, and it's going to keep happening until people take some fucking responsibility and don't <clears throat> don't allow it to continue. And, yeah, it's, yeah. And finally, Trash Hearts launched its own website. I'm going to get these guys to talk about because they designed it. Uh, I didn't know that we were going to do this. <laughs> you, 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 you explain it, Ryan. You explain the website. So yeah, we're basically, me and Jackson have been working on the website for the last couple of weeks now. Um, we decided that we wanted to have a bit more of an online presence. So at the moment we have, you know, your YouTube, your, your social media platforms, etc. Um, where you can kind of go and view our content or keep up to date with everything trash arts in terms of the films that we're making. Or, um, for example, Senseless with the Indiegogo. You can still donate if you want. That would be awesome. Um, the link will be in the description below. Uh, but in terms of the website, we wanted to have a one-stop shop where we could actually have a load of our own content on there, a bit more about us and who we are in terms of our story and the, the progression of the company. Um, but also, with some of our feature films that are out there that you can purchase, you can now go onto our website, which has launched today, as Sam said, and um, actually buy these um, through the links that we've set up. Um, so yeah, the, the website will be in the description below. If you guys want to check it out, please check it out. And um, yeah, as always, support us on all the different level of social media and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. But yeah, thanks for that, Sam. I appreciate the, the industry stuff and I appreciate the, the website You're <laughs> push. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, moving on, guys. We, well, we, I say Sam, had the pleasure of interviewing the, the French-Canadian director, Maud McCall. Uh, so, yeah, Sam, I'll let you take over and uh, take it away. I'm here with Maud Michel on the Trash Arts Talk. How are you doing? You good? I'm good, thank you. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. What got you into filmmaking? Um, well, when I, when I was a kid, I really... Uh, my grandma's the one who babysat me, so she was a big cinephile, and she would, like, watch these afternoon movies. So when, when I would come, out, come home from school, I would, like, watch those movies with her. So she got me into movies at a very young age. So I it pretty much was brought up on the, the golden age of uh, Hollywood cinema. And um, then afterwards, um, I developed a passion for reading and for writing. So I just really loved telling stories. And that's something that I really wanted to develop, like really stimulate my imagination and just create those stories. And then a few years later, I got into stage acting, and I really enjoyed acting. But at some point um, during my teenage years, I started becoming more interested in the behind the scenes of uh, cinema. And then I realized this was a great way, filmmaking was a great way to kind of like um, lump these three passions together. Mm. Uh, the creating story aspect, the, um, the like, you know, the acting aspect to a certain extent. It's more like I really enjoyed the... Um, the the aspect of a uh, stage performance and really like seeing how um, this is created and how intention is being like you know um, is being put into um, a certain body movements and certain ways of deliver of delivering uh, certain lines. So I thought that was a very very fascinating way to just kind of like lump those two passions together. And that's when I decided to look more into that filmmaking thing, and I started reading all those books that I could get my hands on, um, just watching movies, reading interviews with filmmakers. And then at some point when I was 16, um, I took my dad's video camera and I tried to make the first short film with friends. And then that just confirmed it. And I was really hooked. And from then on, I just like kept making films until I went to university and studied cinema uh, more seriously. So what would you consider to be like the first film where you could feel, I don't know, like um, a distinct style that you wanted to do? Um, the first one, like what, you mean that inspired me in a way? Or? 
I, I suppose like there's always that film where <clears throat> like as a filmmaker you, you kind of go okay that feels like my real first film oh um that I could, yeah I guess it's hard to say um because I I made a lot of um of short films on my own before even learning how to do filmmaking so those felt very fairly serious at the time because I took them very seriously but I'd say um, my first real one where I really felt like, okay, I'm doing this and there's a vision behind it all and like, you know, I'm just taking this seriously as a business and as a career um, uh, career stepping stone uh, was a segment that I did for an anthology film called Frankenstein Unlimited. So um, my segment was called Reflection. And it's a, it's a short that deals... Uh, well, the whole goal of the anthology was to... Um, uh, to create new spin on the major themes of the the book Frankenstein. So it wasn't so much about the monster itself, but more about what are the great themes that are present in uh, in the classic book. Uh, so I, I made a short uh, that's a lot about uh, you know social uh, social isolation, like the questioning around beauty and and uh, what society expects of us, also what makes what makes someone a monster versus like in terms of appearance versus like you know what behavior and like um how people act with one another so that that was the first uh, yeah that was my first film that i really kind of considered like okay this is this is my first real film that you know i stand by are you driven more towards like horror films or is it just a genre that you can kind of easily say what you want to say through I, I'm driven mostly towards horror films because it, it's one of the first genres that I really fell in love with uh, as a kid because it felt like it was so imaginative and there's so much you could do within that genre. That being said, I was also a very huge fan of like Hitchcock films, so like thrillers, which is kind of like the little brother of like horror films. Mm. Um, so it's like those two together are like something that, that really like interests me and that I find myself gravitating more towards because I feel like you can really push that like idea of like the metaphorical approach and really um, um, address different thematics and subject matters but in a way that's like different and imaginative and doesn't like more metaphorical doesn't really uh, necessarily have to be like grounded in reality so mm. I really love like you know those genres for like the the subjective potential uh, that they have no, I, I kind of, res- I completely respect that and agree with you. And when we started working together, you would, uh, you took part in two of our anthologies, Philia, and our home videos. Yeah. Um, how do yeah. you find like getting involved with the anthologies, like working with uh, Vestra Pictures and other companies, working with their films? Oh, I, yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed the experience. That was so great. Uh- um, I, I participated in another Best for Picture anthology a few years back called um, 60 Seconds to Die 2. Uh, and yeah. I just, yeah, I just really, really loved the experience. So, like, I kept on, like, looking and I, I keep following a little bit, like, you know, which, which anthologies, like, you know, you guys are doing. So, like, I find they're really, really fun to participate in. Um, so, yeah, I really, um, really enjoyed the really enjoyed doing uh, the home videos and Philia, especially Philia. I, I, it has a little special space, like, you know, um, mm-hmm. like, you know, in, in, the, in my heart, because I mean, it was so, like, the, the, the concept itself is very true to the kind of stuff that I, I enjoy. Like, I'm really into, I guess, like, the more, like, psychosexual nature of horror. That's, like, you know, something that, that appeals to me a lot. Mm-hmm. So I really like that this anthology was, like, right up the type of things that, that, that I was into. And I can't wait to see the full final thing. There's always like a bit of a um, bit of a sense of like slight dark humor with some of the films you've done with us, or or yeah. more of a misdirection of humor where you kind of I don't know, like um, home videos. You, you the scenario was there was a, a sense of vulnerability, but then you like kind of swung it around and actually she was the one that was kind of capturing the person who was perversely watching her. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I I think I gravitate naturally towards dark humor. I'm not somebody who's really into comedy, but I feel like, especially with the horror genre, like, pretty much everything has been done. Like, you know, it's just very hard, I, I feel, to be 
um, creative and do something new. So I think sometimes my way of like doing things differently is really like taking that spin and then just veering it into like, you know, um, like have the unexpectedness of it, you know, because mm. I feel to me, um, I could just do another like, you know, countless, like, you know, rehash of, like, a stereotypical story that you'd hear about. But then, like, you know, most likely people would see it and be like, okay, sure, whatever, next, you know? So I, I like to try to add my own spin into it. And I think more often than not, it comes across that way. So. When, when it comes to networking, obviously anthologies help to get more, it helps you get more out there, like, worldwide, especially working, like, British, American, across Europe, wherever you're working. But, um... As like filmmaking in Canada on an independent level, how do you find it? Is there, is there ways to help to push you forwards? Um, do you do you find that doing anthologies gives you any more reach? Well, I think the great thing about anthology is that because I mean I've participated in both like those bigger projects like yours that, that are more international based, but I've also participated in more local anthologies. Um, in the case of local anthologies. Uh, it was great because I got to like meet like in person like other filmmakers who maybe I've heard about them for a few years or or like you know we've just never met or like you know so it's great in terms of like you know just building that network and just meeting more people and like being more aware of like who does what and and I find it's very helpful then afterwards like to find people to help collaborate on other mm. projects. And in terms of yeah, like the more uh, bigger anthology like yours, I think I I think I like ended up like Facebook friending like a few of the other filmmakers. So it definitely is great to to um, discover and like find out like who else is doing the same type of things that you're interested in, and um, and then just like following their work and just have your work be shown in context. Um, in a way, it's it's a little bit I feel like attending a film festival, but in a different way. Like you know, I love going yeah. to film festivals, and it's great because you know you get to discover all these new filmmakers and see these ideas that you might not have like you know thought of, or like you know that are completely new. Um, so I feel like anthology, they're like like mini film festivals in a way, and and it's great because you get to to share your work and then also like discover uh, the work of uh, new filmmakers as well. No, you, I, I completely agree with you. It is like a shared opportunity to yeah see other people's talents and for people to see your talents. And like you said, you do get to like network to some degree and see if you can help each other in different ways, even if it is from like a massive distance. We're all trying to help each other in the end. Yeah, exactly. And and the great thing I feel, and that's one of the, the reasons, I mean, I love anthology so much is that I'm someone creatively and very stimulated by uh, restrictions and by challenges. You know, I like just having these, like, you know, like, I don't know, maybe I'm a masochist, but I love, like, these, like, impossible situations where, like, I need to figure out a way to make, like, to make something fit or to make it work. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like anthologies are great for that because they push my creativity, like, you know, in a way that might, that I might not have thought of, you know, and by like you know forcing me to think about certain type of stories that i might otherwise not have had any interest in addressing or try to think of certain limitations and like what can i do within like that one particular limitation like um, and how can i bring my own touch you know so so i think they're really great for that do you think um also with the anthologies because obviously um i know that you haven't made a feature film yet but I know this oh, is... Oh, no, I, I have, actually. I've made a feature. <clears throat> well, I've read IMDb completely wrong. Apologies for that. No, sorry. It's okay. Did those anthologies <laughs> no, help no, you with the like feature? it's been, like, a few years back. No ah. worries. So how was it making your first feature? Uh, it, was, it was a tremendous learning experience, I gotta say. Because I went with the complete DIY, uh, self-financed, self-produced route, so... Um, let's just say, like, I thought, because I, at, at that point I had made at least, like, a dozen short films, so I figured out, like, oh, I can do this, it's just, like, a bunch of shorts, like, one after another, just in a condensed time, and there's, like, nothing kind of really properly prepares you for a feature, I feel, like, you know, there's always going to be something that you never saw coming, like, mm. you know, a problem that you need to be like, oh, I need to to address this or that so but it was great it was a wonderful it was a really wonderful experience i'm very proud that i did it um i learned a lot and i definitely feel like it's kind of like um you know that like i feel like 
the first feature is the one where like you can you can allow to make like yourself to make mistakes and then yeah. learn from them. So now I'm kind of like at the point where like I can't wait to do another one so I can like you know just apply those things and like not make the same mistakes. So. So what is the plan for next? Like obviously you know not considering what's going on now. What what were you working on or what are you looking to work on? Um, well, I have several projects that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, I am trying, just because, again, um, it was such a challenge with a very limited budget that I'd love to be able to finally do, a, like, a, a feature where, like, I do have a decent budget. Like, it mm. doesn't have to be big, but just, like, not basically have to call in favors from, like, everyone. Um, so that would be great. So, um, I have a project that I've been shopping around for a few years and it has been optioned by, uh, by a company. So I'm like really hoping this, this goes through, like we're in development right now, but these things can take so much time. Like, you know, it's got to a point where like my feature was released in 2014 and ever since I've been trying to get something else off the ground, like, you know, through, I guess, like the proper channel for lack of a better term, you know, meaning that. I'm not going to do it myself and I'm trying to get it picked up by, by someone else and to actually get a real crew and, and producers on board. So, um, so it, it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of uncertainty. So I'm at a point where right now I'm like trying to uh, write something that would be um, more feasible, maybe like, you know, risk myself to do another like no budget, you know, type movie so i'm kind of like toying with the idea but yeah so i guess the plans are a little bit up in the air right now as in like i am working on different things um at once it's just that i have nothing really concrete yet um and confirmed but i will be making uh two new new short films in the year um i was supposed right now to be shooting one but because of the covid situation it's been pushed back like pretty much everything so Mm. hopefully by the end of the year I'll, i'll manage to get it done well, hopefully you will. Thank so, you. <laughs> so, like, um, let's say you've, because uh, I always ask people this, and they instantly want to just say, if I had a budget, I would make the film I want to say, uh, make, make the film I'd want to make. But is there any really dream projects? Like, if you had a like a like a book you wanted to tra- uh, translate into a film, or just a particular story you've always wanted to tell? Oh, that's really interesting question. The, the, the way you put it, because it's funny. Because I mean. My definition of a dream project has changed so much over the years. Um, It used, like, I think, like, very much, like, now, I don't necessarily have a dream project per se, but, like, the idea of a dream project is more, like, being able to make a film with a decent budget, like, that itself is a dream project, you know? Um, I feel like recently I've had more of, like, a dream cast, like, you know, kind of like a list of people that I, I would like to have a chance to work with during the next time. So that's, it's, it's kind of shifted to that, like not so much about the project itself, but like the opportunity to, to work with certain performers um, and within certain genre, um, still like, you know, uh, like, you know, themselves. And if not in terms of like books or like adaptation, I mean, um, I, I guess like, it's funny because, I mean, the two things that come to mind are, are, are um, works that have already been adapted uh, to the screen. And I guess, in a way, it would be more like a very respectful reimagining in a means of, like, updating them. Not that there's anything wrong with the original. Mm. I'd like to put a um, spin on it. So one of them is uh, the French uh, movie uh, The Eyes Without a Face, you know, Les Yeux Sans Visage, which is mm. from the 60s if I'm not mistaken, uh, which is totally phenomenal and great. Um, but I'd love to be able to kind of like put my own spin into it and maybe like try to make it as a giallo or inspired type work. Um, and then the other one is uh, Valley of the Dolls, which is like one of my favorite books. So I'm well aware again that there's a film from the 60s and that's more like, you know, if, if I could adapt like any book, that would probably be it. That's the thing, isn't it? Because like you can respect the original take, but there's always your own sort of spin you'd want to bring to something, you know? Yeah, and I mean, in a way, it's it's almost like the original is very beautiful and poetic, but mm. it's in black and white, and it's like, again, not that there's anything wrong with it. I love black and white. I just, I'd really love to do something that's like 
opposite meaning that it's like completely like you know vibrant colors and and a very kind of like argento inspired palette you know just to kind of have the very much like very vibrantly uh, you know punchy colors of the 60s but uh with a more um you know a more i guess uh, updated approach to uh to to the story you ever thought of um you know just taking some little elements of the story and you know, tweaking him a little bit and being inspired by it and taking, just doing your own version? Well, maybe, potentially. That could be uh, something I could consider, yeah. <laughs> I, I've, uh, I've already sort of, like, thought about it. So I figure, yeah, that, that's uh, that's definitely an idea I'm keeping in mind as a maybe down the line that could be something I can do. Well, fingers crossed there with everything that's coming up. It's been really good chatting to you, and I, and I really do hope that you get involved with more of the anthologies, and Philia should be out next year, hopefully. Perfect. Sounds good. Oh, I definitely will. Uh, it's just at this point, it was just a question of, like, timing and everything, but, yes. I mean, like, like everything is, um, especially with this, like, crazy COVID thing that's just, like, throwing everything, like, you know, out of whack. It's like I don't... Like, you know, it's just like trying to figure out how can I just even make a movie in this like context, you know, so it's just like, but it's like, again, like, like I said, I, I'm, um, I love challenges. So I like trying to think of ways to uh, bypass all of this and maybe think of new ways to work. So hopefully soon. Yeah. No, that's, that's completely the only attitude to have right now. It's been lovely talking to you more than I hope you have a good Thank day. You. Thank you. Lovely talking to you too. Have a great day as well. Bye bye. So, thank you, Sam. Great interview. Uh, so, moving on to our monthly horror discussion. Uh, this month, we decided to kind of talk about demons and um, yeah, their impact within horror films. Uh, so, my first recollection really is The Exorcist. I think. Yes, most people's. Yeah. 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 I remember being a kid and like I knew that the, the kid was possessed, but. I never really understood how she could still turn her head the whole way around. It freaked me out. It was just, it was crazy. I think that's the thing with The Exorcist. Like, there's so much stigma built around it. Because it was the first film where demons and demonic possession was really put into, like, a mainstream forum, I guess. Yeah. Because The Exorcist was based on a book by William uh, Bleaty. And it's based on a true story, supposedly. But obviously Christianity's not really wanted to represent the devil on the screen they or, really... or demons generally demons yeah, yeah like yeah. they just do not because they want to they don't want to depict it coming real I guess <clears throat> and The Exorcist was the first one that kind of broke that you do have Rosemary's Baby but again that's not really demonic possession it's not too much about the devil it's more Satan as the general figure isn't it mm. the demon in The Exorcist Pazuzu is from like it's from um, Islamic faith which they kind of introduced at the beginning Oh, if you remember, yeah. like, yeah. no one ever really remembers at the beginning set in, like, the Middle East. And mm. there's all the big old artifacts. You see the big statue of uh, Pazuzu standing there. And, of course, the rest of the story is more focused in on what happens to the little girl. Mm. Um, the thing with demons, and in particular with this film, is that demons are used very well for metaphors. Yeah. And it could be, it could be kind of, like, mental health things. It could be social things. It could be anything, really. Just kind of things well, that people... Of, like Christianity as well, I suppose, to a degree. Yeah, but that's, that's the thing. If you look at the Exodus from a perspective of, like, it's a single mum trying to raise a daughter, some people can see the Exodus, um, the possession itself is like puberty, of her changing and her not knowing mm. how to look after her. And then from the Christian understanding, you would go straight to, right, the devil's there. In a sense, if you want to talk about that, in a sense it could be, like, if she's a single mum and you don't necessarily know what's going on behind the scenes with, like, the father and stuff, it could be that controlling factor of father trying to manipulate the daughter to turn her against her mum. Like, if you want to kind of analyse yeah, it like that. Yeah, mm. that's the beauty of the most demonic <laughs> films. There is usually more of, um, there is something underlining there. Yeah. Yeah. It's something, it, it's like... Uh, with, I mean, with the Exodus, especially with the sort of ideas that you put in and the puberty and stuff, is like the idea of having uh, a dual personality is, is uh, something where, you know, this is the person that they were or that they should be and this is the thing that they've become because of this this outside force. Influ that's, yeah, outside uh, influence. influence kind Which of thing. Which is a stable thing of possessions in general. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the funny thing I think about The Exorcist is, is, you know, the church obviously really didn't like it at first, um, yeah. but it did really well for them, yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, the Exorcist came back, 
I the th- Vatican started do- having was more... It, was <laughs> it not like a, a... I remember we were talking about this briefly the other week um, when we were discussing this, and, um, like... They had the studio had people planted in the audience of yeah. cinemas mm. to like run out as if they were so scared. Which people still believe that people killed themselves and all this kind of stuff mm. and it didn't happen, but it was perfect. Hyped it up. I think I think that's the thing with with demon films and really good demon films like The Exorcist. Sure, there's a metaphor underlined, but it's still a horror movie. Mm. It's still, still definitely a demon oh, yeah. film. Yeah, it would I be weird I, to be like, nah, there's no demon. I like, think a lot of horror films are like that anyway. There's always that underlying sort of mm. factor within yeah. it about society or, you know, just general things. Yeah, I think that, like, the d- demons are quite often used as a comment to sort of hold up a mirror to society. And I've been thinking about um, the entity recently, and I've only just sort of thought about it from this framework since after, you know, all of the awareness of, of Me Too and, and those kind of things. Do you think uh, uh, the entity, obviously, uh, was, uh, I don't know if you know or not, if you've I've seen not it seen or not, it. you've not seen it. Um, it was a film um, about a, a single mother um, who starts getting attacked by a demon and she is just consistently throughout the film raped by this demon. And it's it's horrific. It's, it's really nasty and it just goes on and on and on and on. And this demon's like an unseen force um, that just sort of like pins her somewhere and, and does this to her. And and in that sense, it's sort of like I, I, I sort of rethought of it as being a bit more of a, a metaphor about how women generally have been treated in society and the essentially continuous rape of women by this by people that aren't talked about. They're not. They're not. There's no justice for it. And so at the time, like that was, I, I, yeah, I didn't realize quite how when did that come out? That film was. It's bad night. I think it was eighty two. Oh yeah, so it's probably way ahead of its time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and um, she could take that and mirror it to like obviously, like you say, Me Too right now, mm. and um, the manipulation with women within film and stuff, or even mm. just in general. Like. Mm. Crazy thing with that one is that's one of the based on true stories, uh, demonic possession ones. Um, I think it's it is one of those interesting things where like if you think of what in my my in my belief of what a demon is or at least how i would use demons in a film your belief or my understanding of you, <laughs> yeah. didn't know you believed in demons sam just goes and sits in his room and like... it's it's that, that a demon is there to torture and enjoy it mm. and that's a really horrific idea and a lot of things in society kind of feel like sometimes they're there to torture us and someone up there's enjoying it mm. so you can easily make them into demons but also, I think it holds up a like you were saying about the about the sort of glee that comes from those demons, the absolute yeah. joy in mm. torturing. Mm. I think the the actually that shows us something about humanity that we really don't like is that when we when we think of you know torture and those kind of things, we like to think it happening under sort of really serious kind of like guises. But you know, really, the people doing the torturing are having fun. And that's the most horrifying thing. It's kind like, of the people behind the scenes pulling the strings. Exactly. Almost, like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, if I and do I think, this, then that'll benefit me in long term. But uh, it's short term pain for long term gain. Yeah. Yeah. A perfect example of that is actually hereditary. Hereditary is obviously about grief, but um, unfortunately, some spoilers are coming. Ryan, I apologise. <laughs> but when when you suddenly realise know what happens that there's a demon involved, pagan. Um, is it pa- pagan? Not pagan. Pagan. The demon in that, like, the whole family had been building to this moment for them to make one of them, like, the, the antichrist of that demon sort of thing, of him coming to Earth. Pagman pulls the strings by having, like, the cult kind of people who are all like, we're doing this for the long run. Hmm. It doesn't matter about the sacrifice of the children. It doesn't matter about your grief. This is part of the bigger plan for them to get what they need. And I think um, that really does, like... And that film really... As it plays more like a drama level as well as a horror, it really emotionally hits you where you feel that. That's a, it's an incredibly intense experience as most people do rightfully say like the modern day version of The Exorcist. It is a very tough experience to watch. You feel the pain of the mother. You feel the pain yeah. of the family. And it's all like planned and it's just for this demon. It's just for them to get their riches. Mm. But then you can go like the completely fun side with demons. <laughs> Where you're still playing on those gleefully torturous elements, and the 80s seemed to absolutely love doing this when you got the Evil Dead. Yeah. 
Because the Evil Dead is just ridiculous, high octane nastiness. It's a vicious, they're all vicious. All three of the films, TV series, they're nasty films. The remake is even more like vicious. Yeah. And they, they completely understand what a demon is. Because there's humour. And I, like we were saying about the gleeful kind of thing, mm. they really push that in um, Evil Dead 2 specifically. Like, it's just that constant torture when he's just stuck in the house and the whole house is like reacting to him not knowing what to do as he's losing his own mind. And I think that's the key thing. It's just they keep on building, building, building. They have no reason to stop. And I think when a film gets that right, where you just feel like, where does this end? And the only place it can end is either A, a ridiculous hero we take you out of reality like Ash, or a bunch of chopped heads in a fucking, you know, like in Hereditary. That yeah. horrible scenario. It's going to end either horrifically, or it's going to end with some supernatural or ridiculous fantasy element. Or another definition, religion. Yeah. Religion's I mean, always a massive part. In uh, Insidious, for example, is, a, is just another that. one that's that's it follows that exact same premise. I mean, I think the first half of Insidious builds it as a as a ghost house film, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then suddenly flips it into a demon film. Um, which uh, we were we were saying earlier, actually, when you think of a demon, uh, you know, suddenly the moment in a in a paranormal show where you're watching them talk about a ghost, and then and then suddenly it's a demon. You're like, oh, they are fucked. Now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, and Insidious played on that perfectly of bringing that sort of element of like this is something worse, and it's going to follow you, and it's going to keep coming. Um, I think that, that, and I know this is slightly horror, or haunted house kind of um, way of doing it, but Insidious, like you say, plays like that initially, mm. so there's lots of little jump scares, you don't see what's going on. For me personally, whenever you're doing a haunted house film, I think it needs to be the unseen, so mm. you just see them little tropes happening, yeah. and, and Insidious does that really well, but then I think where it excels is right at the end or towards the end, when you start to see that woman who's trying to possess the, mm. the kid and, like, take a form in the, the normal world. Um, yeah, that works perfectly as well. Mm. I think because Insidious <laughs> is kind of more open to being in the fantasy realm with demons by kind yeah. of opening it up a little bit more. Mm. Yeah. When, you, when you restrict it to the whole, like, haunted house, actually it's a demon thing, mm. Paranormal Activity is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Because you're seeing the tropes and you're like, oh, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And then you st and you as an audience are like, this isn't a ghost. Yeah. Someone's going to well, say it. Yeah, what Jack was saying is like, as soon as it starts to become a little bit more mm. and you start to realise that it's a demon, it's like, nope, they're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it, Paranormal Activity really, it's still, I think a lot of people still probably think it's more of a haunted house movie because the of first the whole one anyway. format, you know, like the whole structure of it. Of, being almost like surveillance. And I've always said for Paranormal Activity, one of the reasons why it works so well is it plays into those NSA times of feeling like someone's watching you. Mm -hmm. It's why it scares the hell out of me. Like that slowly, again with the demon, waiting slowly for the right time to take what it wants. Mm -hmm. And with Paranormal Activity, you're seeing that from like... The hidden cameras? Yeah, so it really plays on that kind of what is happening and who is listening in sort of thing. It's like I said to you yesterday, I think it was, um, that it's that element of you like the demons watching you while you're watching the demon watch you, mm. like and it, that whole kind of weird cycle. Like, can you imagine if you know we set up cameras in here and you picked up on different things and you're watching that and then as soon as it starts to manifest into something a bit more volatile and violent. And well, I think that's what. Um, uh Paranormal Activity did so well was um, it, it made it hyper real um, mm. like it was beyond making a, a normal sort of horror film realistic and adding that sort of like you know and taking away those ex like silly kind of fantasy elements that, that can be in horror and make it more fun sometimes it, it much more uh, played on the fact that you were just looking into someone's life and it yeah. wasn't it, it wasn't like a big sort of you know drama or anything like that it was just you know there was nothing because nothing else. really happens within yeah. it it's just like they're sitting at home and you know they're chilling out whatever or and then certain stuff starts to happen and the, yeah. the kind of story I mean, it is, builds up from that because the yeah, relationship yeah. obviously but the story 
like moves forward because of the stuff that's happening, mm. not yeah. because oh you know there's a drama or they fall out because of mm. you know life or whatever, and then certain things start to manipulate around it. Um, it's driven li- like literally by that. Mm. I think um, yeah, like that's the thing. You you can always bring it into context of what's going on at that time, and then display it in the the best medium. And that was like the best medium for it. Mm. When you go back to, um, I think it's 1927, <laughs> I think, for Hacksaw. How old were you then? Non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was the great um, film Hacksaw, which comes across as a documentary about witchcraft and demons and all that kind of stuff. But really, if anything, it's almost like a mocu- mockumentary of it. It's, it's yeah. a strange experience. But the relation that they do, that obviously when women were having... I don't know, mental health problems or just any sort of things that contradicted the man, maybe straight to the devil's there. That's why things are changing. The demons are in there. They've changed who she is. Burn her! Mm. And Hackson was one of the first films to ever do that. And the, the demon in that is so... I don't know, it's like when you see that image, you might not even know that it's related to that film, but it's so iconic. The, the, the white demon with the horns and... That's the thing with demons, there's such a physical image to it that you build in your own head. So paranormal activity doesn't ever show you the demon, which works perfectly. Mm. But most demon films, the best demon films, will not show you the full creature. It'll be a slow release. The Exorcist is obviously one of the perfect examples of that because they did the jump cut, not the jump yeah. cut. The subliminal shot, sorry, of where you just see the face coming in, but it's just for a second. Mm. And if you see it the first time, you'll think yourself, what that face was... And you're building an even more grotesque image of it. And then yeah. it, you can go into that more fantastical world, like say in the, in the Evil Dead or the Night of the Demons, where it is more like, there's a demon right in front of you, and you can still have fun with the grotesquerie. It's so alien to like, from the more um, hopeful kind of godly, you know, the, the, the dove image, the white, the innocence. Mm. A demon is always grotesque. It's it's fiercely sinful in its in its imagery in itself, you know. So can I just ask you guys, um, of your own opinion? So for me personally, whenever I watch a horror film in general, and even with demons, I find it more exhilarating for me as a viewer watching something that I can't see. Like you said about the paranormal activity, you just see a face, and then it's left to your imagination. So I kind of I prefer that personally. What would you prefer? Do you prefer seeing it or not seeing it? Um, I think I prefer not seeing the demon itself because there's something scarier about it being um, in your mind. non-corporeal almost, like not having a physical form and just and just having physical ma- manifestations of certain like things. Like so, in The Exorcist, you know, um, the the way that her body changes and stuff. Because um, that's the thing. I you know love... it's not her. And yeah. The fact that something's controlling her, but you can't see it. Yeah, exactly. But also, you know, you you don't want to take away that sort of uh, use of practical effect, effects effects yeah. and and things like that that can really sort of um, blow your mind, as as you sort of said when you were young and, and the head turning round and stuff. Um, so, like, I I think that you've got to have a bit of both. You've got to see physical Enough manifestations. Of it to have fear. Yeah, but but not. And not to... see it itself to in order to limit it because once it's limited to like a physical form it, it can't surpass that you yeah. know Sam? I think with um, with physical form like it depends on what kind of horror you're trying to create if you're opening it up to like a fantasy world like Hellraiser Hellraiser is like physical form demons they're in the film pretty much throughout it's not really a tease and you in the world is so like insane that you're like okay I'm in I understand this even although debatable whether they are demons Mandy has those demons in the leather and you're just like all right I've gone into the world now I don't know what I'm watching let's just go with it fantasy horror allows that so when I see a like a fucking beautifully designed physical demon like in the old 80s movies and stuff I get excited because I'm like wow look there's a monster and I really like monsters I've got a <laughs> soft spot for monsters no so I love physical design <laughs> but you're right sometimes in the right kind of film you just want to use those sort of sound effects or um, just, yeah, like practicality, it. yeah. It just depends on what kind of story you, tr- you want to tell, really. I think if it's... A, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, probably, it's my opinion. So don't correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, in terms of, like, possession films and stuff, the less you see 
the more your mind creates. Depends on the actor, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does. But Hereditary, right? I haven't seen it, but I've seen clips of um, the actress who like does. Tony Collette. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and she like is absolutely fantastic in the way that her body morphs and stuff. And that when she becomes possessed. I think there's a scene where she's trying to get up to the attic, she's sort of banging her head. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, Jesus. Like, that is really intense, mm. but you can't see what's possessed her, but your mind then goes into overdrive. Well, on a different degree with that, like, if, um, if you remember The Last Exorcism, did you ever get a chance to see that? That was a found footage horror film about, um, I think it was uh, literally just an exorcist who goes to the farmhouse and he's got a question psychologically, is she being abused or is it possession? And because the actress can do a lot with her body, like with her limbs and stuff, she can really push how twisted, because it's all found footage. You're staying on those shots and it's more about performance convincing you that something has taken over her. I think I might have seen that years so, ago. So yeah, I, I think it, it does depend. It really depends on the kind of film you're trying to tell. With possession films, it is quite fun if you bring in something a little bit stranger, like um, the film Possession, which uh, is an 80s film. It's really the possession and the whole demon thing is more about divorce in itself. And it's high drama, it's nuts. But when it gets into the demon elements, there's one continuous shot where she's being possessed and she does it like a dance performance and there's like stuff coming out of her mouth and it just stays with her. And it's like, it's exhausting, it's, it's, it's crazy. And she just lets her performance take over it, but there's also the practical side of it. And then later on you see more of what the physical demon is. It's all about just getting the right mix because demons... It's an idea of psychology, isn't it? It's different levels. It's, it's the idea of what you physically see, what you think you experience, which is that invasive feeling of something taking over you. And then there's also the perspective on the other people who are seeing what's happening to you. Because a possession film, you rarely see many possession films where it's from the perspective of the person who's possessed. Hmm. It's more other people seeing what could happen to someone. I think you kind of... Yeah, in terms of... <laughs> in terms of horror films... Um, I think, yeah, you never see it from the perspective of someone who has been possessed. But then, ultimately, maybe not necessarily a horror film, but you see it more in like a mental health sort of way. So if you think yeah. about the Joker, for example, if you were to look at that from another perspective, like someone else looking at that, they've changed, they manifest into something slightly different and become a loose cannon. Like that, I know he's an adult and stuff, but that, that could still ultimately deter someone and be like, Oh, yeah, that's, if that's, you bring in a religious factor to that, it's like, oh, he's possessed. I think that's one of the Unnatural. main things that, that demon um, uh, Gets you demons sort of like the, uh, you know look at is, is mental health and, and mental states and stuff. Because like even uh, you know as we're discussing it in puberty, there's a lot a lot of mental health going on in, in there where you're you're changing and 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 uh, developing. Um, there's a, you know the same with grief is is something that can really affect your psychology. Um, there's a few of them. I mean, obviously, um, post traumatic stress uh, yeah, yeah. disorder is is one that comes up as well. Well, there's if you remember, there's a, that documentary called The Nightmare about sleep paralysis, mm. and everybody has a different understanding of what sleep paralysis is, and it all depends on your background. And obviously, sleep paralysis is the idea that these shadow creatures come at night. But for a lot of people, they're demons because they have a religious background. That's what they had to understand, that that dark thing is there. And I think that's probably one of the more prominent reasons why demons come up in so many films is religion itself has, had, has its different versions of demons. Every culture has demons. Mm -hmm. And it's always going to make some money because it always <laughs> plays off on it. And sometimes you get these I don't think that films. was the intention initially. But. Depends. I mean, literally, culturally, you just get so many, the, the same demon just being sold in different packages. You think oh, like yes. low-budget horror films, how many demon films are out there? There are loads. There are loads. I'd love I suppose to see in a way, you, you can kind of uh, have a chicken and the egg argument with, with demons. and, and uh, You know, yeah, what came first? <laughs> demons or negative emotions? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it was only like in the last, what, 10, 15 years? that mental health has actually sort of been recognised so I would probably say demons <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know do you know what that's given me an idea of like we should actually create um, a possession film but from the perspective of the person that's being possessed we have written one called Suffer Well which we hope to develop soon yeah, yeah that's been in the works for, for eight years, years. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool so guys hope you enjoyed our horror chat um, just bear in mind we'll be doing another one next month and um, one last thing for me, really, before 
uh, we wrap up is we've actually released the first six episodes of the podcast, Trash Arts Take, on Spotify. So please give it a check out. Also, remember, in the description below, we'll have the link for our website. Have a look at it. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel as usual and give us a like, leave a comment. And uh, as ever, take care. Trash Arts Take out. Bye-bye. Be safe.